Grandma here, and I'm reading Tom Sawyer. We had a rather exciting e uh, event with Becky and Tom being lost in the cave. Um, and, the, and Tom was able to uh, rescue them by finding a, another hole to climb out of. <clears throat> that it turns out is five miles from the entrance. Um, and then he, while he was at Judge Thatcher's house, he found out that the judge had padlocked the door to the cave, which means that Injun Joe was trapped, unless he also found that exit. Chapter 33, Protection Against Ghosts. Within a few minutes, the news had spread and a dozen skiff loads of men were on their way to McDougal's cave. The ferry boat, well filled with passengers, soon followed. Tom Sawyer was in the skiff that bore Judge Thatcher. When the cave door was unlocked, a sorrowful sight presented itself in the dim twilight of the place. Injun Joe lay stretched upon the ground, dead, with his face close to the crack of the door, as if his longing eyes had been fixed to the latest moment upon the light and the cheer of the free world outside. Tom was touched, for he knew by his own experience how this wretch had suffered. His pity was moved, but nevertheless he felt an abounding sense of relief and security now, which revealed to him in a degree which he had not fully appreciated before, how vast a weight of dread had been lying upon him since the day he lifted his voice against the bloody-minded outcast. Injun Joe's boy knife lay close by, its blade broken in two. The great foundation beam of the door had been chipped and hacked through with tedious labor. Useless labor, too, it was, for the native rock formed a sill outside it, and upon that stubborn material the knife had wrought no effect. The only damage done was to the knife itself. But if there had been no stony obstruction there, the labor would have been useless still, for if the beam had been wholly cut away, Injun Joe could not have squeezed his body under the door, and he knew it. So he had only hacked that place in order to be doing something, in order to pass the weary time, in order to employ his tortured faculties. Ordinarily, one could find a half a dozen bits of candle stuck around in the crevices of this vestibule left there by tourists, but there were none now. The prisoner had searched them out and eaten them. He'd also contrived to catch a few bats, and these also he had eaten, leaving only their claws. The poor unfortunate had starved to death. In one place near at hand, a stalagmite had been slowly growing up from the ground for ages, built by the water drip from the stalactite overhead. The captive had broken off the stalagmite and upon the stump had placed a stone wherein he had scooped a shallow hollow to catch, a, catch the precious drop that fell once every three minutes with the dreary regularity of a clock tip. A dessert spoonful once in four and twenty hours. That drop was falling when the pyramids were new, when Troy fell, when the foundations of Rome were laid, when Christ was crucified, when the conqueror created the British Empire, when Columbus sailed, when the massacre at Lexington was news. And it is falling now. It will still be falling when all these things shall have sunk down that afternoon of the history and the twilight of tradition and been swallowed up in the thick night of oblivion. Has everything a purpose and a mission? Does this drop falling patiently during 5,000 years to be ready for this fitting human insect's need? And had it another important object to accomplish 10,000 years to come? No matter. It is many and many a year since the hapless half-breed scooped out the stone to catch the priceless drops. But to this day, the tourist stares longest at that pathetic stone and the slow dropping water when he comes to see the wonders of McDougal's cave. Injun Joe's cup stands first in the list of the cavern's marvels. Even the Aladdin's palace cannot rival it. 
Injun Joe was buried near the mouth of the cave, and people flocked there in boats and wagons from the town and from all the farms and hamlets for seven miles around. They brought their children and all sorts of provisions and confessed that they had had almost as satisfactory a time at the funeral as they could have had at the hanging. The morning after the funeral, Tom took Huck to a private place to have an important talk. Huck had learned all about Tom's adventures from the Welshman and Widow Douglas by this time, but Tom said he reckoned there was one thing they had not told him. That thing was what he wanted to talk about now. Huck's face saddened. He said, I know what it is. You got into number two and never found anything but whiskey. Nobody told me it was you, but I just knowed it must have been you as soon as I heard about that whiskey business. And I know you hadn't got the money because you'd have gotten at me some way or the other and told me, even if you was mum to everybody else. Tom, something's always told me we'd never get hold of that swag. Why, huh, Huck, I never told on the tavern keeper. You know his tavern was all right the Saturday I went to the picnic. Don't you remember? You was to watch there that night. Oh, yes. Why, it seems about a year ago. It was that very night that I followed Injun Joe to the Witters. You followed him? Yes, but you keep mum. I reckon Injun Joe's left friends behind, and I don't want him scouring on, souring on me and doing me mean tricks. If it hadn't been for me, he'd be down in Texas. Then Huck told his entire adventure in confidence to Tom, who had only heard of the Welshman's part of it before. Well, said Huck presently, coming back to the main question, whoever nipped the whiskey a number two nipped the money too, I reckon. Anyway, it's a goner for us, Tom. Huck, that money wasn't ever in number two. What? Huck searched his comrade's face keenly. Tom, have you got on the track of that money again? Huck, it's in the cave. Huck's eyes blazed. Say it again, Tom. The money's in the cave. Tom, honest engine now, is it fun or earnest? Earnest, Huck, just as earnest I ever I was in my life. Will you go in there with me and help get it out? I bet I will. I will if it's where we can blaze our way to it and not get lost. Huck, we can do that without the least bit of trouble. Good as wheat. What makes you think the money's... Huck, you just wait till we get there. If we don't find it, I'll agree to give you my drum and everything I got in the world. I will, by jings. All right, it's a whiz. When do you, when do you say? Right now, if you say it. Are you strong enough? Is it far in the cave? I've been on my pins a little, three or four days now, but I can't walk more than a mile, Tom. It's about five mile into there, the way anybody but me would go, Huck. But there's a mighty shortcut that they don't know that anybody but me know about. Huck, I'll take you right to it in a skiff. I'll float the skiff down there and I'll pull it back again all by myself. You needn't ever turn your hand over. Let's start right off, Tom. All right. We want some bread and meat and our pipes, a little bag or two or three kite strings, and some of those newfangled things they call Lucifer's matches. I tell you, many's the time I wish I had some when Becky and I were out there. A trifle afternoon, the boys borrowed a small skiff from a citizen who was absent and got underway at once. When they were several miles below Cave Hollow, Tom said, now, you see the bluff there looks all alike all the way down from the Cave Hollow? No houses, no wood yards, bushes all alike. But do you see that white place up yonder where there's been a landslide? Well, that's one of my marks. We'll get ashore now. They landed. Now, Huck, where we're standing, you could touch that hole I got out of with a fishing pole. See if you can find it. Huck searched all the place about and found nothing. Tom proudly marched into a thick clump of sumac bushes and said, Here you are. Look at it, Huck. It's the snuggest hole in the country. You just keep mum about it. 
All along, I've been wanting to be a robber, but I knew I'd got to have a thing like this where to run across it was the bother. Now, we got it now, and we'll keep it quiet, only we'll let Joe Harper and Ben Rogers in, because, of course, there's got to be a gang, or else there wouldn't be any style about it. Tom Sawyer's gang? It sounds splendid, don't it, Huck? Well, it sure does, Tom. And who will we rob? Oh, most anybody. Waylay people, that's mostly the way a gang does it. And kill them? No, not always. Hide them in the cave till they raise a ransom. What's a ransom? Money. You make them raise all they can, often their friends, and after you've kept them a year, if it ain't raised, then you kill them. That's the general way, only you don't kill the women. You shut up the women, but you don't kill them. They're always beautiful and rich and awfully scared. You take their watches and things, but you always take your hat off and talk polite. They ain't anybody as polite as robbers. You see that in any book. Well, the women get to loving you, and after they've been in the cave a week or two, they stop crying, and after that, you couldn't get them to leave. If you drove them out, they'd turn right around and come back. It's so in all the books. Why, it's really bully, Tom. It better, it's better than being a pirate. Yes, it's better in some ways because it's close to home and circuses and all that. By the time everything was ready and the boys entered the hole, Tom in the lead, they toiled their way to the farther end of the tunnel, then made their spliced kite strings fast and moved on. A few steps brought them to the spring and Tom felt a shudder quiver all through him he showed Huck the fragment of candle wick perched on a lump of clay against the wall and described how he and Becky had watched the flame struggle and expire. The boys began to quiet down to whispers now, for the stillness and gloom of the place oppressed their spirits. They went on and presently entered and followed Tom's other corridor until they reached the jumping off place. The candles revealed the fact that it was not really a precipice, but only a steep clay hill, 20 or 30 feet high. Tom whispered, now I'll show you something, Huck. He held his candle aloft and said, look as far around the corner as you can. Do you see that? There, on the big rock, over yonder, done with candle smoke. Tom, it's a cross. Now, where's your number two? Under the cross. Hey, right yonder's where I saw Indian Joe poke up his candle, Huck. Huck stared at the mystic sign a while and then said with a shaky voice, Tom, let's get out of here. What? And leave the treasure? Yeah, leave it. Indian Joe's ghost is around here, certain. No, it ain't, Huck. No, it ain't. It would uh, haunt this place where he died, out of the mouth of the cave. This is five miles away. No, Tom, it wouldn't. It would hang around the money. I know the way of ghosts, and so do you. Tom began to fear that Huck was right. Misgivings gathered in his mind, but presently an idea occurred to him. Looky here, Huck. What fools we're making of ourselves. Injun Joe's ghost ain't a gonna come around where there's a cross. The point was well taken. It had its effect. Tom, I don't, I didn't think of that, but that's so. It's luck for us that cross is. I reckon we'll climb down there and have a hunt for that box. Tom went first, cutting rude steps in the clay hill as he descended. Huck followed. Four avenues opened out of the small tavern where the great rocks, excuse me, cavern where the great rocks stood. The boys examined, three of them with no result. They found a small recess in the one nearest the base of the rock with a pallet of blankets spread down in it. Also an old suspender, some bacon rind, and the well-gnawed bones of two or three fowls 
but there was no money box. The lad searched and researched this place, but in vain, Tom said. He said, under the cross. Well, this comes nearest to being under the cross. It can't be under the rock itself because that set solid on the ground. They searched everywhere once more and then sat down discouraged. Huck could suggest nothing. By and by, Tom said, looky here, Huck. There's footprints and some candle grease on the clay about one side of this rock, but not on the other side. Now, what's that for? I'll bet you the money is under the rock. I'm going to dig in that clay. That ain't no bad notion, Tom. Tom's real Barlow was out at once, and he had not dug four inches before he struck wood. Hey, Huck, you hear that? Huck began to dig and scratch now. Some boards were soon uncovered and removed. They had concealed a natural chasm which led under the rock. Tom got into this and held his candle as far under the rock as he could, but said he could not see the end of the rift. He proposed to explore. He stooped and passed under the narrow way, descended gradually. He followed its winding course, first to the right, then to the left. Huck at his heels. Tom turned a short curve by and by and exclaimed, My goodness, Huck, looky here. It was the treasure box, sure enough, occupying a snug little cavern along with an empty powder keg, a couple of guns and leather cases, two or three pairs of old moccasins, a leather belt, and some other rubbish well soaked with the water drip. And I do have a picture to show you. And you can see the treasure chest right here and the powder keg. I gotta turn the page. <gasps> Got it at last, said Huck, plowing along among the tarnish coins with his hands. My, but we're rich, Tom. Heck, I always reckon we'd get it. Just too good to believe, but we have got it. Sure. Say, let's not fool around here. Let's snake it out. Let me see if I can lift the box. It weighed about 50 pounds. Tom could lift it after an awkward fashion, but could not carry it conveniently. I thought so, said he. They carried it like it was heavy that day at the haunted house. I noticed that. I reckon I was right to think of fetching the little bags along. The money was soon in the bags, and the boys took it up to the cross rock. Now let's fetch the guns and things, said Huck. No, Huck, leave them here. They're just the tricks to have when we go to robbing. We'll keep them there all the time, and we'll hold our orgies there, too. It's an awful snug place for orgies. What's orgies? I don't know, but robbers always have orgies, but of course we've got to have them, too. Come along, Huck. We've been in here a long time. It's getting late, I reckon. I'm hungry, too. We'll eat and smoke when we get to the skiff. They presently emerged into the clump of sumac bushes, looked warily out, found the coast clear, and were soon lunching and smoking in the skiff. As the sun dipped toward the horizon, they pushed out and got underway. Tom skimmed up the shore through the long twilight, chatting cheerily with Huck, and landed shortly after dark. Now, Huck, said Tom, We'll hide the money in the loft of the widow's woodshed, and I'll come up in the morning and we'll count it and divide, and then we'll hunt up a place out in the woods for it where it will be safe. Just you lay quiet here and watch the stuff till I run and hook Benny Taylor's little wagon. I won't be gone a minute. He disappeared and presently returned with the wagon, put the two small sacks into it, threw some old rags on top of them, and started off, dragging his cargo behind him. When the boys reached the Welshman's house, they stopped to rest. Just as, about, just as they were about to move on, the Welshman stepped out and said, Hello, who's that? Huck and Tom Sawyer. Good, come along with me, boys. You are keeping everybody waiting. 
Here, hurry up, trot ahead. I'll haul the wagon for you. Why, it's not as light as it might be. Got bricks in it or old metal? Old metal, said Tom. I judge so. The boys in this town will take more trouble and fool away more time hunting up six bits worth of old iron to sell to the foundry than they would to make the twice the money at regular work. But that's human nature. Hurry along, hurry along. The boys wanted to know what the hurry was about. Never mind, you'll see when we get to the Widow Douglas's. Huck said with some apprehension, for he was long used to being falsely accused, Mr. Jones, we haven't been doing nothing. The Welshman laughed. Well, I don't know, Huck, my boy. I don't know about that. Ain't you and the widow good friends? Yes. Well, she's been good friends to me anyways. All right, then. Why do you want to be afraid for? Hmm. This question was not entirely answered in Huck's slow mind, but he found himself pushed, along with Tom, into Mrs. Douglas's drawing room. Mr. Jones left the wagon at the door and followed. The place was grandly lighted, and everybody that was any consequence in the village was there. The Thatchers were there, the Harpers, the Rogers, the Aunt Polly, Sid, Mary, the minister, the editor, and a great many, many more, all dressed in their best. The widow received the boys as heartily as anyone could well receive two such looking beings. I imagine they were kind of muddy and scruffy looking. They were... That's the next sentence. They were covered with clay and candle grease. Aunt Polly blushed crimson with humiliation and frowned and shook her head at Tom. Nobody suffered half as much as the two boys did, however. Mr. Jones said, Tom wasn't at home yet, so I gave him up. But I stumbled on him and Huck right at my door, and so I just brought them along in a hurry. You did right, said the widow. Come with me, boys. She took them to the bedchamber and said, Now, wash and dress yourselves. Here are two new suits of clothes, shirts, socks. Everything's complete. They're Huck's. No, 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 thanks, Huck. Mr. Jones bought one and I bought the other. But they'll fit both of you. Get into them. We'll wait. Come down when you're all slicked up, though. And then she left. Well, my goodness, what is going on? It sounds like they're going to have a wedding or something. Hmm. Meanwhile, they've got the gold out in the wagon. Wonder what they're going to do with it. I hope it stays out in the wagon. Nobody steals it. Well, we'll find out in the next chapter. Bye-bye.